So I think the number one problem for churches in America today is allowing the Bible to be disrespected and disregarding and what the Bible tells us is the way to have eternal life and the way that tells us how we ought to live. Julius Wellhausen was a preacher in the 1800s. Actually, he wasn't so much a preacher as he was a <clears throat> theologian. He taught in four different seminaries. Julius Wellhausen. Julius Wellhausen is number three on my list of people who today are damaging the world driving the world away from God and away from His truth, though they are dead. Julius Wellhausen. Here's what he came to believe and what he taught in those seminaries. He believed in biblical evolution. He said that those beginning writers of the Bible basically were cavemen who didn't know anything about God. Okay, so there went inspiration. There went respect, authority, reliability. There goes the idea that God is the one who superintended over the writers of Scripture. He said they're just cavemen and they didn't know anything about God. So they just began to dream up their thoughts and write down the things they thought God might be like. And they told stories. And they are, he said, they are delightful stories in the Bible, written by cavemen apart from God who wrote what they thought to write about God. <laughs> that over time they developed their thoughts and they added one legend upon another legend, but that none of it is true. Only wonderful man-made stories. Julius Wellhausen developed a theory it's called the JEPD theory, or the JEDP theory, or you can arrange those four letters any way you like to. Uh, I'll tell you the way I usually arrange them, though there is a proper order, but uh, it's lost. But I like to call it the JEDP theory because that is Jed P, and that sounds a little like Jed Clampett. So it's just easier for me to remember if I call it the JEDP theory. Here's what it said: Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. That is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those were not written by Moses. They were written by those cavemen people. One of them is, one of them is called the J writer. He just called the Jehovah writer because he used the word Jehovah a lot. And then there's the E. That's because that writer used the word Elohim. So he's called the E writer. The D writer wrote the book of Deuteronomy. So he's called the D writer. And you get the idea. Hmm? But that these people knew nothing really as inspiration from God. They just wrote down anything they wanted to, and there's not one, but there's four writers. Well, other people took Wellhausen's word and expanded on it. Some of them said, ah, oh, there's eight of them, eight of them. And the sky's the limit. Look, you can say anything you want to say after a while. You can just dream up any idea you want to, though it's a theory only, but you can teach it for truth as long as people will listen to what you're saying. And the same thing is true today. Wellhausen reached a time that he quit one of his seminary jobs. Here's what he actually said. This is not a quote, it's a paraphrase, but it's close to the idea. He said, I've realized that I have been hired to teach young men to pastor churches. But I've realized that that is impossible for me to do knowing what I believe and what I teach them. In fact, what I've realized is that they can't pastor churches after they're my students. Why? Because they no longer believe the Scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that the JEDP theory is being taught all over America in our seminaries and Bible colleges to this day? Though anyone who has any respect whatsoever, in my view, for the scriptures of God would throw this out as fake news. It's still being taught. And do you know that people 
who aren't far from what you believe are sending them money by the hour, by the moment, money goes. You see, these places can't operate without money, and they're being funded by people who think that they believe the Bible. They're being funded by people who think that they still hold the historically strong position they always held, but so many of them no longer do. So that what you end up with are people like, I'm going to call a name here, I'm not doing it out of spite, I'm doing it out of a heart of love and grace, but I've got to tell people the truth. So we have people today like Andy Stanley, who is a major player in a certain denomination's movements, though he never uses the denomination's name in his ministry that I can see. But he was in an interview with a, with a heavy hitter in church circles, and he was asked this question. Pastor Stanley, let's imagine for a moment that you are the evangelical pope. In other words, he said, you're in charge of all the churches. You have mastery over them. You tell the churches what to do. That's the question. Pastor Stanley, let's imagine that you are the evangelical pope over all the churches. What will you have them do? Here came Pastor Andy Stanley's answer. Take the spotlight off the scriptures. Now let me expand that answer a little bit. I want to be fair and true. The expanded answer was, he said, take the spotlight off the scriptures and put it on the resurrection. Now I want to ask you a question tonight. Okay, if we, if we take the spotlight off the Bibles, if we stop teaching that, and we teach the resurrection, what can the resurrection of Christ tell our children about marriage? Nothing. For all practical purposes, not one thing could you gather from the resurrection of Christ about marriage. Marriage. Now you can make some indirect applications. But if the resurrection is all we have to teach, listen, how do we know anything about the resurrection of Christ without the scriptures? They're trying to get the spotlight off the scriptures. And here's what they say. The Bible is okay, but it's just old. It's old. And God is doing something new now. I am now an apostle. This is the message of the new apostolic reformation. There are some among us all that have been anointed by God as modern day apostles. And we now speak the fresh truth of God. One of their quote prophets has said the Bible says anything I want it to say. Do you think that should be allowed to stand? Mm -hmm. Who is speaking out the truth about the new apostolic reformation? I can tell you of kids who are losing sleep at night over the things that are being taught by the quote, new apostles. No one is receiving the word of God today to be spoken spontaneously. The Lord already has given His Word, sealed it up, and told us to look for the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So the new apostolic, again, is another major force. I, I can't tell you how strong this is today. It's a major force against what we believe the authority of Scriptures is the only way to tell us how to have eternal life and how believers ought to live today. Amen. What I find all over the place is this disregard and disrespect for the Scripture. This is why, church, we are losing the game today. So many believers are not valuing the teaching of the Scripture. Now, I've given you a couple of examples. I could go on, but I don't want to 
I don't want to spend more time than I should on these examples, but would you take my word that from coast to coast across America today, there are major movements, I believe, of Satan who uses people that seem to be godly who devalue the truth of Scripture. And that's why we're in trouble. This is why the gospel is not being established. It's why the Christian life is not being taught. It's all about opinion, what's popular, what's entertainment value, and what's the easiest way to go. How many of you believe marriage is easy? Some parts of marriage are easy. Some parts of marriage are just a whole lot of fun. Amen? But buddy, there's a time when marriage is work and commitment and sweat, blood, and tears. Hmm? But God told us marriage is for keeps. That's right. Everybody doesn't have to get married. You don't have to get married. If you can't find somebody good, please don't get married. But marriage is not something you try. Marriage is something you die for. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But today, the battle over love and marriage is all about what the Bible says or what it doesn't. So if you're frustrated with this um, falling down, if you're frustrated with the ungodliness that you see around, if you're frustrated when you see a kid who was raised in church, then become an adult, begin to make his or her own decision, you see them making terrible decisions, it all comes down to this. Do they have in their mind a high value of Scripture? And here's what I find all over the place. There are so many people who want to make a stand for God. They want to have a witness for God. But they don't know how to show the authority of Scripture. See, even some of the people that I've named tonight, they went to those seminaries. They went to places where Julius Wellhausen and his theories about cavemen and biblical evolution were accepted and taught. And it knocked the shine off the scriptures for them. And they've gone out into a world now that will cut you off at the knees if you say something godly or correct. Cancel you. And a whole lot of these guys are going, well, it's hard to take a stand for the scriptures. Let me tell you what I think is harder than taking a stand for the scriptures, not taking a stand for the scriptures. That's what's hard. You know why? You're no longer now in harmony with God. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but he stiff arms the proud. He resists. The word resists. It's the word stiff arm. Who wants to be stiff on? Who wants to be out doing the ministry and find out at the end of it all the whole time you thought you were doing something for God, you actually were being stiff armed by God because you weren't running in the same track God was running in. That's what's hard. So I think that the, the best thing, the greatest thing we can do is buckle down and love the authority of the Scriptures. But now, how can we have the authority of Scriptures in our mind and in our hearts? unless we know the truth about them. So tonight, I want to do something a little unusual. It's not usually what evangelists do. And I don't give a hoot about that. I want to do what God leads me to do to establish the truth of God, beginning with the gospel and extending into how believers ought to live in this world. And I think that we need training more and more, training on top of training, about how we go to bed at night knowing that what we're holding in fact is God's final word for us in the world today. Mm -hmm. If you come upon someone and they won't receive the gospel, it's probably because they don't think the Bible is a believable book. If you talk to someone out there who's gone to college, any, any normal liberal arts college, they have been absolutely attacked in their freshman classes. And all the way through the four years of college or five it took for them to get a basic degree. Because the Bible is slandered from the get-go. And they will, will so gladly on the first day of class tell those freshman students the Bible is full of contradictions. And we don't have enough students today who have been equipped in their own churches to answer that question in their mind. Is the Bible full of contradictions? What we need are students who raise a hand and say, Sir, excuse me, but you just said the Bible is full of contradictions. Would you show us one, please? 
Because so many of those professors don't say the Bible is full of contradiction because they study the Bible at night and have come to that good, sound conclusion about the Bible after study. No, they say it because they once were freshmen too. And they had a professor tell them the Bible is full of contradiction. And on and on go the lies that come against the Word of God. So I want us to consider the Bible. Do you have yours in your hands right now? Let's talk just for a moment about the, the origin of Scripture. Where did it come from and why? Well, the Bible is written by at least 40 people. At least 40 different people. God superintended over all 40 of those people and gave them what to write down. The Bible is not of any private interpretation. That is so often quoted in the southern portion of our country, but rarely is it defined what that means. When the Bible says it's of no private interpretation, what it simply means is that nobody ever sat down among those 40 plus people and said, ah, today I think I'll write a part of God's word. That's not at all the way it happened. Those people were superintended over by God and He breathed His Word into them, through them, and right out down to the writing instrument that wrote down the Word of God given by God to people. Those 40 people, how long was that span? What do you think? From the time the first person who happened to be in the Old Testament, when he wrote his first word of the Scripture, until the last person wrote the last word of their scripture, how many years do you think it took to write the Bible? That'd take at least 10 years, right? What do you think? 15, 20, 100, 200 years. How about that? 200 years to write the 66 books of the Bible. 39 in the old, 27 in the new. How long? 500 years? It's a long time. Where were you 500 years ago? How many generations would that be? How about about 1,600 years? About 1,600 years. So let's reason together. When the first person wrote his part of the Bible, the last person wasn't even born. They never lived on planet Earth at the same time. So tell me, how, how did they write something about God that will be uniform, that will be in agreement, and even live at the same time. Walk back down your family line. How many of you know your great-grandfather's name? You know your great-grandfather's name. Let's see. I got one person in the building who knows a great-grandfather's name. Two. Do I hear three? Give me. <laughs> Only two people in the crowd this size know the name of their great-grandfather. Well, that's only that's only a couple generations. That's about 150 years. We've got a span that's 1,600 years long, and you put 40 writers across that span. Obviously, many of them weren't even alive at the same time. They didn't want to know one another. They couldn't compare notes. They had no opportunity to sit down and discuss this before they wrote. You know how odd that would be? You know how odd it is to find agreement? Do you know right now I could probably make a statement. I could say, go and write a story about the New York Yankees. And some of you would probably write, the New York Yankees are horrible and they should never have won that war they fought in against the southern states. <laughs> Someone else might write, the New York Yankees are a terrible baseball team. They've never won anything. Then someone might write, I love the New York Yankees. I have one of their hats on my table. Which is pretty sad. <clears throat> Do you understand what I'm saying? It's so hard to find a table full of people who agree on things. How about a room full of people? How about an auditorium? How about a stadium full of people? How about over 40 people who didn't even live on the world at the same time, who in fact lived on three different continents who spoke two major languages that separated the first 39 books from the last 27 books. How do you have people writing in different languages? How about this? Those 40 writers were of all kinds of different backgrounds. 
Some of them went to school. Most of them were outdoor people. They were farmers, shepherds, and people like that. Among them was a doctor, Luke, the beloved physician. There was a king who wrote. There was one person who wrote the scriptures that started out as a shepherd boy and ended up being a king. Is that good? Is that good? What I'm telling you is that there are shepherds, fishermen, farmers, all different kinds of vocations, all different kinds of educational levels who lived over a 1,600-year span on three different continents, and you take their writings all about the same subject matter, and they all fit together like a solid dovetail joint in a master craftsman's drawer. Is that good? Is that good? How on earth could that happen that way? Because all 40 writers were superintended over by one God who engineered the whole project. The, the Bible books then, all 66, were bound together and called the canon of Scripture. Here's why. In Georgia, we have a plant that the Cherokees and Creek Indians who were there before used often. It's called River Cane. River Cane. It's a native cane, and it's uh, about a thumb's width in diameter. They used it to hollow out and make blow guns, they made arrows from it, they used it in all kinds of ways, and cane is found pretty much all over the world, hmm? different kinds. When you became the king of a domain, it was your privilege to institute your measures for things. So often a kind of cane would be taken and the king would say, well, our standard unit of measure is going to be so long. Sometimes it would be from the king's nose, to the end of his hands when it stretched out, and they would measure that cane and cut it right there. That's now the standard of this kingdom. Is that good? Is that good? So that standard measurement was called a canaan. A canaan. Do you get it? So when they put the scriptures together, they put them under five solid tests to determine, is this book really from God? And many books were rejected under those strong tests. But if they met the test, they were included in the Canaan, the standard measurement of God about what His Word will be. Now, when any speaker speaks about God, His Word is to be held alongside the standard measuring unit, the Word of God, and is to be rejected or held by its agreement or disagreement with what God's standard says. Is that good? Is that good? And so this is the origin of Scripture. You can rest, you can rest tonight knowing that verifiably you are holding the word given by God through 40 authors that is holy scripture of God. This is the way of everlasting life, and this is the way that saved people ought to live.